Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Good to see you here. And if you're online uh, from home or wherever, good to have you with us this morning. Let's go ahead and stand together. And if you're online, if you're able to and wish to, go ahead and stand with us as well as we begin our singing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. let the people rejoice. All oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, Lord we lift up your name. this morning, at least behind masks. It's good to have you here, uh, especially for those who are here for the first time, maybe again after a while. We're, we're glad to see you this morning. And for those who are joining us online, thank you for doing the same. Uh, my name is Colin Packer, and I'm the lead minister here at Greenville Oaks. And I uh, want to just welcome you this morning as we seek to, to be a people that are on, uh, on mission with God, to inspire people to follow Jesus, and convincing them along by, by the, the show of our lives and the testimony of our, our mouths that uh, following Jesus is the best way of life possible. Uh, this morning we'll be sharing in a time of communion in a little bit and so if you're at home joining us we encourage you to have those uh, your your bread and juice available for that time and if you're in the room this morning uh, those uh, those cups are available out at the tables on some of the places that you came in and we encourage you to to get those if you haven't yet uh, gotten a cup in preparation for our communion time a little bit later. I want to also thank those of you who have uh, continued to give financially during this season. Uh, you've sustained uh, this church as we've sought to be a, a refuge for people in the midst of this uh, difficult season and, and also reaching out to our community in important ways. And so I want to encourage you to continue to do that, either through online giving or if you're in the room this morning, 
Uh, there are those boxes as you leave today that you can place uh, those checks in, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, we'd, we'd be blessed by whatever you have to give this morning to give to God, uh, we, though we're not passing trays this morning. And you'll also notice that there are cards in the uh, chair in front of you, and so we encourage you to take one out uh, that says e either members, for those who are regular attenders here, regular members, and there's also a guest card if you're uh, this is your first time or you haven't yet become a part of this church family, we'd love for you to fill that out. And then there's a prayer card also. And uh, we know in this season there are so many of us that have prayer needs and concerns, and so we want to know about those. We want to be lifting those concerns up in prayer. And so be sure to fill those out, and you can place those in those offering boxes as you leave a little bit later uh, today. Uh, well, you'll notice we have a little smaller team than we normally do, and I just want to thank Ron Zilke for leading this morning. Early this week, uh, Adam Looney, our regular worship minister, had a direct exposure to COVID, and so we knew he was going to be out this Sunday. Uh, but then later in the week, uh, at our practice, actually, we had a, an exposure as well. And so we've asked all those who uh, were here on Thursday night who uh, are, are uh, to, to be at, remain at home and, and to not be here out of an abundance of caution and making sure we're caring for this church. We're grateful so far that we haven't had a, a spread in our service uh, beyond those that we've uh, shared with you about. Um, I guess my wife was actually the first <laughs> who was here, and we're grateful that God spared uh, the church through that. And so we're doing everything we can here at Greenville Oaks to make this a safe experience. And so I'm grateful for this team that's been able to be here this morning to lead us in worship. And you can be in prayer for uh, for those family members uh, from the church that are, are waiting and in quarantine, making sure that everything's safe going forward. But we are grateful to be here this morning, and we'll be praying uh, for them and I'm praying this morning that God will be in our presence and that we'll encounter the living God this morning as we uh, are reading through the story and continuing in that way. So I want to pray for us now, and then we'll continue in our worship uh, here in just a moment. God, we, we lift your name on high. You are the God who is above all gods. And God, we are grateful for your presence in our lives, uh, for the ways that you uh, inspire us through being together in worship, for the encouragement we receive from just seeing each other, God, in this room. And I know there are many online who haven't yet uh, been able to do that yet, haven't been able to be here. And we want them to know that we miss them as well, that they are just as much part of this church family. And we long for the day we'll get to reconnect with them as well. But God, in this season of distance, in this season of isolation, in this season of uh, just uh, worry and concern, we pray that you would relieve our anxieties. And we cast those cares and those anxieties on you. Uh, and we release them to you, God, in prayer this morning. And so, God, as we encounter you through uh, singing today, through your word, and through a time at the table, God, we pray that we would encounter you, that we would meet you, and that you would send us back out filled up, God, overflowing with your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll be standing now as we continue in our worship together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord Ceases. His mercies never come to an end. 
to our time at the table this morning and uh, we encourage you to take that that cup out or, or have those elements ready if you're online with us this morning I want to direct our attention to a passage of scripture uh, as a meditation before we uh, partake of communion this morning in Psalm uh, 23 uh, this is a, a passage that maybe some of you memorized or, or that you'll recognize uh, I'm sure this morning but there's uh, this sense, and, and as we're walking through the story, which is the series we're in here at Greenville Oaks, and I'll be preaching a message a little bit later on the story of Israel and just the challenges that they're walking through as the exile is coming upon them. Uh, it's a dark season for Israel. And, uh, and, and for many of us, this has been a challenging time. It's been a, a, a season of, of similar concern in our lives. And Psalm 23 is a place that we go. I, I, this is a passage I go to at funerals in particular because it is a, a message of the comfort of the shepherd who's it, it involved in our lives. Uh, and so I want to read from Psalm 23, and I want you to pay attention to that language of the table that we come to this morning because it shows up here in this passage, uh, the God who prepares a table for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Truly your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This language in this NIV version is different than I learned it, and it was the King James Version when I remember memorizing this growing up. And those words, they, they stay with me. They stick with us, don't they? They're, these are, are words that have been read at important moments in our lives and challenging seasons. We may return to them. And there's that line in this about, even though I walk through the darkest valley. And I know some of us who are worshiping this morning uh, along with us, whether that's uh, in your living room or that's here in this room, this is one of those dark seasons for one reason or another. Challenges that you're facing, grief that you're walking through. And the promise of God is that we are God's sheep and he is our shepherd. That he leads us to places of refreshing. But that even in those times of darkness, even when the, the valley seems darkest, that God meets us there in that season. And he prepares a table before us amongst the enemies that we face. For some of us, that darkness may be enemies that we face. Maybe specific people that we have in mind this morning that we're thinking, God, where are you? Why are you not coming to my defense and my rescue? But the promise of Psalm 23 is even in the midst of those seasons, no matter what assaults we may be facing, that God prepares a table for us in those moments. And this morning and every Sunday, we have a table that we uh, gather around. It's a, a figurative table now, unlike maybe the worship center you grew up in with that altar that may have been there. This do in remembrance of me. That was my memory this time. But regardless of the space that we're in, there's a table that God sets before us, even in the presence of those enemies. And, and David was one who was able to say, God, I, I, I feel your presence as the shepherd. I feel that you are providing what's needed in this season. And so as we come to the table this morning, as God is our host if, and Jesus joins us, uh, all are welcome here in the midst of whatever enemies you may be facing, in the midst of whatever grief or dark valley you may be walking through. The promise is that, that God is here among us. And it was the same way when Jesus uh, instituted this meal, when he was there at the, the Passover meal on that Thursday evening before his death. And he had enemies before him, even in his, at the table there among him, right? There was one who dipped in the bread who was going to betray him, Judas, just uh, minutes and hours later. And yet Jesus remained at that meal with his enemy before him, and God raised up his life. And the same promise is true for all of us who are in Jesus Christ. The promise that we will all be raised up 
in the end, the promise of resurrection. Let us pray as we close our, our, our as we uh, share in this time of communion this morning. God, you are the good shepherd in our lives. And there have been seasons where we've wondered if there would be enough, but God, up to this point, there has been enough. And God, some of us have walked through some dark valleys, and maybe right now is that dark valley that we're walking through, wondering, God, where the sunlight will be, wondering where your presence is, wondering if you hear our prayers. And God, the words of David are uh, meaningful to us this morning as we come before this table. Because it was David who provided a table to Mephibosheth, even the uh, son of uh, an enemy at times of his, King Saul. And in the same way, God, today, uh, we need that reminder that you meet us at tables in the midst of the enemies in the valleys we face today. And so, God, we long for your comfort of your rod and your staff that you talk about in, in, in this passage in Psalm 23, God, and we are reminded of the darkness that you faced, that your son faced on Calvary, and how his body and his blood were given for us. And so God, as we take this meal, we remember that moment. We remember that even though he felt you were absent and cried out, why have you forsaken me, O God? That three days later, God, it was clear that you were present the whole time and that your resurrection power was available to him and it's available to us as well. And that gives us comfort in these dark valleys as well. So God, uh, right now we're gonna take communion and we're gonna remember this story. And we're gonna thank you for all that you're doing and continue to do in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Uh, you can be dismissed at this time through the door here to my left. And our children's worship ministry volunteers, they'll be at the door there to greet you and guide you down to the children's worship area. So now's the time for the children ages 3 through 6th grade to go if they, and uh, a parent can go with them as well. So, And the rest of us, let's stand together as we sing one more song before Colin's lesson this morning. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I roam in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. of a 
31 week journey through the story of scripture and we're using a, uh, a resource called the story uh, that basically gives uh, chapter by chapter an opportunity for us to read uh, a good chunk of scripture a good piece of understanding the larger story of what God's up to and so uh, if you don't have a copy of the story after service you can go out these doors and uh, there'll be someone that can help you uh, get a copy if you'll just fill out your guest card and take it to uh, the back there, or, or find me, I'd be glad to help you get that, because we want uh, each of our people in our church family to be reading the chapter ahead of the week that I'm preaching on it, and so we're right in the middle of the Old Testament, or, or nearing the end, I guess you could say. We're almost to the punchline of the story, and our hearts beat fast for Jesus to come. Part of the genius of this uh, journey through the story is it puts us in the shoes of of those who came, were, were on the earth before Jesus came. Right now we feel that same longing they felt <laughs> of, God, okay, Israel keeps messing it up again and again. Can we just get to the good news? Would you bring your promised Messiah? They longed for things to change, Israel did. But they couldn't muster that change through their own righteousness. They couldn't become the community God wanted them to become and, and perfectly show the world what it meant to follow Jesus. They needed to realize that hope was going to have to come outside of themselves if it was going to enter into the world. I don't know about you, I'm getting tired of the same pattern being played out with Israel. <laughs> over and over again, they seem to not get it, right? They sin, and then God forgives them, and then God uses them and says, I can use you now with your forgiven state, with your righteous state. But I think this is actually uh, very relevant to our own lives, right? Because as much as we may want to throw stones and and, and judge the Israelites for their failure again and again, I can raise my hand and say, that's my story too. If, if my story were told, it would be the same. Colin sinned, but God forgave Colin, and now God can use Colin in his forgiveness. So if you're longing for something new, I want to assure you, in a few weeks we're going to get to the story of Jesus and his birth. But for now, we're in one of those dark sections uh, for Israel, that exile of Israel. Let us pray as we open God's word this morning together. Father, we know you are the God who is above all gods, and we praise you this morning. We lift your name high. We thank you for meeting us at the communion table. We thank you for meeting us in our worship of you. And God, we have no doubt that you'll meet us again as you have for so many years, as the reading of your word is given, as your spirit speaks. And I pray it would speak powerfully, not my words, but yours this morning. I pray this morning you would pour through me the gift of preaching so that Christ would be formed in our hearts, and that we might leave today encouraged that there is hope in the midst of dark times. I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Well, as we've read, Israel's had its share of dark moments so far. And this week's chapter, I think, is the darkest it gets. This is the close of the story of the southern kingdom of, of Judah, Israel uh, is going through. In chapter 17 of the story, covers several kings in Judah, from Manasseh, that's the first that we'll read about in, in 2 Kings chapter 21. In fact, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be kind of going a lot of different places this morning in Scripture and reading quite a bit, but we'll uh, kind of have a, a starting place of 2 Kings chapter 21. It, it starts with King Manasseh, and it leads to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile for the people of God. This is the end of Israel as they've known it. For so long they wanted to have a promised land, and now they've received that promised land. They've had a king on the throne, but that kingdom has been divided following the reign of Solomon. And they've had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and all these kings, most of them at least, have been unrighteous. They've not done what's right in the eyes of God, and neither have the people of God. And, and so this morning we're going to pick up with that story of King Manasseh. We read about that in 2 Kings chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hebzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He re rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord he built altars to all the starry hosts. 
He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Again, this is a dark time. King Manasseh rebuilds the very things that his father Hezekiah had torn down, all of these altars. And that's how we know if it's a good king or a bad king in Israel, is the bad kings are the ones who are raising up these altars and raising Asherah poles and worshiping these false idols. The good kings are the ones who tear them down. And we've just been at the reign of a good king, King Hezekiah, but his son doesn't follow his ways. And it gets even worse than I think it's ever gotten before at the beginning of verse 6, as I read just a moment ago. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. Now, if you remember back to the story in Genesis of Abraham and Isaac, you remember a, a time where Abraham was challenged with this own idea that sacrificial system of a, a son would be killed to somehow appease the gods in that story. Genesis 22 is a challenging passage and chapter. It's challenged people about, uh, how, why would I want to have faith in a God who would demand this sacrifice of my son? And, and Abraham climbs the mountain with a command from God to do just that, to sacrifice the child of promise. And, and what I said as we were back in Genesis 22 earlier in the story was that in those days, this was normal. It was normal for ancient religion in those days. And, and according to Jewish tradition, Abraham's father was actually an idol maker. And so before he's called by God to leave his family and go to the land God would show him, this was the normal uh, reality for him. He served these other gods. He grew up hearing about all this the gods of, of, of ancient times in, in that time period. And ultimately, in those ancient religions, the sacrificial system was a way to appease these angry gods. All these gods were angry. They had these humans on earth that they just kind of got tired of and were fed up with that did the bidding of the gods. And so if you wanted to, to have a good crop, if you wanted fertility, whatever it might be, what you did was you sacrificed. And, and year after year, you would sacrifice more because, well, if you... If, you, if it was successful, the crops this year, then you wanted to do more the next year to make sure they weren't mad. And, and if you didn't do enough and things befell you that weren't so good, then you wanted to make sure you sacrificed more. And that always ended up in the most valuable gift you could give, which was your firstborn son in that culture. See, the shocking part of Genesis 22, as we studied uh, weeks ago, isn't that Abraham willfully goes up the mountain to sacrifice his son. That was the demand of all the ancient gods at this time. The shocking part of Genesis 22 is that this God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Yahweh, doesn't demand child sacrifice. He provides a ram in place of Isaac. And later on in the law, in the time of, of Moses receiving the commands that they're to follow, the people of Israel, we find out that child sacrifice is something that the people of God should never be engaged with. In fact, I want to go back there to Deuteronomy, this chapter that shares about this. Deuteronomy 12, verse 31 you must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the sacrifice, in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. The commands there in the law never get to this place that you sacrifice your children. That's what these other religions do. And yet that's exactly what King Manasseh, the king of Judah, has done. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. This, as I said, is a dark time in Judah. And God is fed up with it. Listen to what he says in 2 Kings 21, where we were a moment ago as we read on in verse 10. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered. By all their enemies, they have done evil in my eyes and aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. And so it goes poorly for King Manasseh, and the next king is King Amon, and he's assassinated after just two years as king. It feels hopeless for Israel. They've already received word of what's going to come. And since the days of the judges, and we followed their journey, 
Occasionally they'll rally for a generation, like King Hezekiah. They'll do what's righteous, but they can't seem to be the righteous nation even two kings in a row or for a period of two generations. They never become the righteous nation God wanted them to become. Because you'll remember with Abraham, God picked this nation to be a set-apart nation, a contrast community to the rest of the nations around them, to live differently. God wanted them to reveal himself and his plan for all people to come back into relationship with him that had been lost in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. And so he gives the law to Moses to give to the growing nation of Israel. And the purpose of the law was to instruct this new nation, this is how you're to live differently. Don't live like you saw done in Egypt. Or in Jesus' words to sum up the law, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. God gave them this law so that the surrounding nations could see their uniqueness and wonder which God must be behind this unique people. These are dark days for Israel. These are dark days. And maybe we feel the same as well. And it's going to get even darker for Israel. Now, when we think back to dark dates in the history of, of our nation, there are some dates that come to mind, right? December 7, 1941. November 22, 1963, September 11 of 2001. When I mention just those dates, feelings begin to well up within us. Images come back to us of maybe newspaper, uh, front page of newspaper, or, or even images on our screen with 2001. It makes us feel a certain way when we hear those dates. And for Israel, there's a date that stands out in their mind. And it's 586 B.C. Anytime anyone would have mentioned that after that date, they would all know what that meant. They would all remember the scenes. They would have all heard the stories of their ancestors that were passed on down and down about how dark a day it was. Now, before we come to 586, the northern kingdom had a different date. It was 722 B.C. when they're overtaken and they're, uh, by the Assyrians and they're sent off to exile. And Judah had watched what had happened. He, they, they knew what had happened to them, and they knew it could happen to them and Judah if they weren't careful and weren't righteous. But in Second Chronicles, the next passage I want to read, verse 36, we read that the writing is already on the wall. Their destruction in Judah is inevitable. This is Second Chronicles 36, uh, in verse 15. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. That's a hard word to receive, isn't it? There was no remedy. God wanted to fix things. God wanted to give them chance after chance, and he had done so again and again. But at some point he throws his hands up and he says, there is no fixing these people. There's no hope. There's no remedy. I've tried everything I can think to do, and, and there's no way to fix this problem. And sure enough, in 586 B.C., God's word comes to pass. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem now for a couple of years. And in 586, the destruction takes place. It's horrific. It strikes at the heart of Jerusalem and its most prominent buildings and structures. We read more about that in, in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 52, verses 4 and 5. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. They encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. Uh, drop down to verse 12. On the tenth month of the fifth month, a day of the fifth month, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, commander of the imperial guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. Yes, this is a dark day in Jerusalem. This is the description of, of what happened as, as ba the Babylonian forces overtake this city. The city walls have crumbled. 
And many of them heard stories about other walls that had crumbled. The walls of Jericho years before, that was God's work, and now it's their own walls that are crumbling. The temple of the Lord, the royal palace, are set on fire and destroyed. And there's got to be a question, and there's going to be a question for Israel for the days that come after this, when they're sent off to exile, when their temple is destroyed. Where do we worship God when there is no temple? In fact, where is God? Because we know God's presence was in the temple. What happens when we don't have a temple because it's been destroyed? Does that mean that God is no longer the most powerful God that's out there? Does that mean, how do we worship when the temple isn't there? Where is God now? This is the end of life as Israel has known it. What hope is there now for Israel? Now, when it comes to stories like these, I think it's important that we listen to these warnings personally. That we don't just read these as pro prophecies for a previous time and kind of leave it there as a historical lesson, that we read these letters as if they're, they're meant to dissect our hearts as well. Often to align ourselves with the prophets, though, is to, is to miss the challenge of the prophets. And that's why we don't just read this from Isaiah's perspective. We read it from those who received these letters. But for just a moment this morning, I want to ask you to put yourselves in the shoes of two prophets of Israel during this time, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Imagine being them, the people that during this time of destruction are passing on the word of the Lord to these people. What it would be like to receive the resistance that they may have received at that time. So who are Ezekiel and Jeremiah? Well, Ezekiel is the prophet of God who ministers in Babylon. And so after 586 B.C., there are people that are taken away to Babylon, and, and one of those people is Ezekiel. He's in Babylon, and he's receiving a word from God, about, and he's trying to help them see, this is why you're here. This is why things are as dark as they are. This is why Jerusalem was torn down. It's because of your sins. But he's also going to point them at, point to them the hope that they should have about the future. And he's going to say to them, look, in the days to come, there's going to be hope that you'll be able to return. But Jeremiah is in a different location, his geography. Jeremiah is a prophet of God that's in Jerusalem. And, and before, during, and after 586 B.C., Jeremiah remains there and, and speaks a, uh, words from God to minister to the people around uh, Jerusalem. So I want you to put yourself in their shoes. How do you deliver a word that no one wants to hear? How do you get a hearing when your message is that the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem because of your sins and the sins of your ancestors? Who wants to hear that in the midst of their pain? It's actually your fault that you're in the situation you're in. Who is going to listen to you when there are other false prophets out there who were trying to say all the positive things and not actually delivering the hard word of the Lord to the people of God? But they have to remember in the midst of this that success for them is not that they get a hearing. That's not their responsibility for people to hear them. Their success isn't measured on the response of Israel at all. Their success is solely based on their faithfulness in delivering the message of God given to them for the people. But that doesn't make their task any easier. Jeremiah has a nickname, <laughs> the weeping prophet. I mean, who wants to sign up for that job? Who wants to be known as something like that? This is the message that they're asked by God to deliver. Ezekiel is told to deliver this message. I want to read from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 22 and 23. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. It makes it clear here, the message that Ezekiel is delivering, why they have had this destruction in Jerusalem. It is for the sake of God's holy name that he has done this. That's been his purpose since Genesis chapter 12, is that all the nations would be blessed, that they would know the name of God, that they would be brought back into relationship with him. But his people haven't been living up to his name. Their idolatry has led to injustice and immorality of all kinds. And God isn't going to let them run around with his reputation on the line. God isn't going to let them wave the Jesus flag so that the nations will confuse God's work with their sinful ways. God is acting for his glory for his name. But Ezekiel doesn't stop with this message of doom 
an explanation. He offers a word of hope as well. And I, I hope for us, for those of us that have received the gift that Ezekiel is about to announce, that we'll see the gift that we have living in our own day. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. This is the promise that Ezekiel gives. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will make uh, for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgrace for your conduct, people of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle you in your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all those who pass it. They will say, this is the land that was laid waste, has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you, that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what is, was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. This is the hope that they have. Is that, yes, there's going to be a time of punishment, a time of atoning for the sins that they have committed. But in the future, there will be a day where the ruins of Jerusalem will be rebuilt, where the fields will be fruitful once again. According to Ezekiel, there is hope, and it's not going to come quickly. This promise is not going to be for the people who receive it. It's going to be for their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But the hope is this. And for those of us who are on the other side of this devastation in Jerusalem, centuries later, who also have hope of the Messiah, the promise of the Holy Spirit given to us, listen to these words because this is our promise as well. God promises that he will cleanse them from their sins. God promises to settle them back in their towns. God promises to rebuild the ruins. But that isn't even the best news. God promises to give them a new heart. God promises to put His Spirit, His new Spirit in them. And that promise isn't just good news for Israel, it's good news for all the nations. Now, uh, this season has to feel for Israel like it's a time of discipline. And that's a, that's a hard thing. If you remember back as a kid and you remember your parents disciplining you, that's never fun to walk through that time. And it's not just when you're a kid, right? We face consequences and discipline in our own lives uh, for, for laws we break, for, uh, for ways that we don't live in tune with the best news that God gives to us. Consequences are there, the discipline of God. And God assures them in the scene. He's trying to say to them, look, I'm disciplining you, but I'm disciplining you for your own good. And this is true in our lives as well. I want to close this morning in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The writer in this passage talks about the discipline of God. And I think this can apply to that, that experience in 586 B.C. and the 70 years or so that follow it before they're able to return to the land. But I think this is also the truth for us as well. And, and sometimes this is hard for us to see. And so if you're in a season maybe of experiencing discipline yourself, consequences of sin or whatever you want to refer to it as. I just want to point us to this to know what the heart of God is for Israel in that time, but also for us in our own time. This is Hebrews 12, verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, 
that you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Yesterday, I was at a basketball game for my daughter. She's nine years old and just learning and picking up the game. And there were a few times that I was sitting there and I watched the coach uh, give it to my daughter pretty hard about the way she was playing. Again and again, she was making the same mistake. And as we got in the car after, I knew that it was a discouraging game and it lost by a few points. But it was more that kind of frustration of coach kind of giving it to her in front of everyone else to see. And I was trying to sit down with my daughter in the car after talking about the game, not focusing on what she'd done wrong. She'd already received the, the discipline in front of everyone. But I said something to my daughter that I think a lot of you probably said to your kids if they've been in sports or they've had opportunities for people to be around them. I said, you know, if your coach didn't see something in you, she wouldn't spend the time yelling at you. If your coach thought you were the one that was going to forever just kind of sit the bench, there would be no attention given to give you the best instruction. And so I know this is discouraging, but I want you to see that she sees something in you and I see something in you as well. And we can work at this. We can, we can get better and we can do better the next time. Trying to help her see that this discipline, or maybe it was more than discipline in this scene, it's actually for her good. It actually comes from a place of wanting her to do better. And as I think about our lives, I think a lot of us can be in that place, can't we? Where we're experiencing hard times. We're wondering, is this the discipline of God or is this just the circumstances in the world? But the Lord disciplines those he loves. It wouldn't be loving to be a parent and not correct your children and set them right on the back, back on the right course. And, and maybe right now you're experiencing that discipline. I just want to pray a prayer uh, for us as we close this morning. That we would know that the discipline we may be experiencing and the consequences, they're actually for our good. It's the loving God who cares for us just as he cared to restore Israel as well. Let us pray as we close this morning. God, I thank you for this story and for this reminder of this dark time for Israel. God, many of us can connect with that this morning. We understand what it's like to experience consequences and challenges. We wonder where you are at times. And yet the reminder of the writer of Hebrews and of Ezekiel and of Jeremiah is that this is for the holiness of God and it's for our correction for our good as well. God, we believe and trust, even in those moments we doubt it, God, that you are a good God who longs for us to be a righteous people. You're a good God who who disciplines us for our good. And God, that can be extremely hard in seasons of difficulty and in the darkest valleys. But God, this morning, we, we want to be a people who undergo your discipline and your correction so that we can point the next generation in a better way. And we can point all the nations to the goodness of who you are. So God, I pray for, uh, for you to, to stick with us even through that discipline, that you would stick with us through the challenging times so that we might see the cities rebuild. So that we might see church rebuilt to where you want it to be. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be standing now as we close our time this morning. My encouragement for you, my blessing for you this morning is that as you leave today, whatever correction or discipline you might experience, you may see the goodness of a God who loves us in that. My prayer also is that God may bless you and that that abundant life that we find in Jesus may be something we share with others. Go in peace today.